I'm just too cheap. And what's the what's the magnification you're using there? Like three or five? I think it's three and a half. It has it has a position there. You can put multiple lenses in. You can double them up. Okay. So I've got another slot, but but anytime I went to a higher power, my working distance became so short that it was kind of impractical. And the higher the power, the the more steady you have to hold your head, and you know, and this works. My theory is if it looks good at three and a half power, it's probably gonna look dynamite to the naked eye. That's true. That's, that's another discussion, a uh, soapbox that I have about microscopes and zooming things up really, really high. I think that there's a danger there. I have a microscope, I use it occasionally. I don't, I don't use it all the time. But what I'm seeing in some of the work is people are zooming their microscopes up and they're becoming so perfect in their cutting and their shading and everything that it's, to me, it's becoming sterile. It's too mechanical. It's too perfect. It's losing its just its, it's life. life. Yeah, talent. it's life. And so that's my rationale and excuse for making all kinds of human mistakes. I'm just trying to make a lifelike, right? That's correct. So are, are we now ready, Rob? I think we got going. Go ahead and do your formal intro and we should be good on both channels. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Tara Mitchell from engraver.com. And I have reached out to my good friend, Lee Griffiths, who is a, an excellent engraver. And we're going to be speaking with him and getting a shop tour today. Um, Lee and I met for the first time at a class in Kansas, actually. It was the first class that Lee taught for GRS, and it was the first class I ever took at GRS. So it was really kind of a very interesting meeting, and we've been friends ever since. So welcome, Lee. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you, and the feeling is mutual. Good friends. And you, you engrave a lot of things. Um, what do you mostly engrave? Guns. Yeah, it's mostly guns. I've done knives on and off over the years and I do, I do some jewelry for some of the local guys. And if something comes in from you know, non-local, that's fine, but uh, it's, it's mostly guns. Okay. And how, um, it, for people that don't know much about you, um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of how you got into art in general and then how you got into engraving? Sure. Um, I've always loved drawing, even, even as a little kid. That was my hobby was just to doodle and draw and whatever. Kind of wanted to do it as a profession, but two things, I guess, prevented that. One, I'm colorblind, and I just figured that if you're colorblind, probably 80% of the job market is excluded to you. So it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. And then I knew my father needed me back on the farm. I was the logical son to go back. I didn't have allergies, asthma. I got along with dad fine. So I felt some obligation to go back. So I went back to the farm. Um, we we'll just, I'd draw on the side, do some portraits here and there for a little bit of side money. And just kept doodling a little bit, but never knew anything about engraving till one day, a couple of neighbors came down in the winter time when we weren't farm, farming quite so heavy. And um, they had a couple of handmade knives. They, their hobby, they were starting to make some handmade knives. And they said, we need these embellished. They knew that I drew. I mean, we, we'd been neighbors for 35 years, right? Um, okay, well, embellished, what are you talking about? Well, scrimshaw or engraving on. Um, I'd never heard the word scrimshaw before. I had no idea what they were talking about. And engraving, I didn't have a visual. I mean, I heard the word, but I, to my recollection, I had never 
remembered seeing anything that was engraved again on ivory. Uh, and I said, no problem. We've got a magazine with some pictures and they brought it down and I looked at it. And I, my first thought was, I'm not a bit worried about the art side of this, but technically I don't have a clue how they're getting this in steel. Uh, but it piqued my interest because it was all black and white. I nosed around and I, I found a, a fellow that did some engraving about 25 miles away, the old traditional way, hammer and chisel. He was an Navajo Indian and uh, gave him a call and said, you mind if I come and see what you're doing? He said, no, that, that'd be okay. Come on in. So went to visit him and he had a real tiny apartment and he engraved on a desk in his bedroom under a table lamp with a hammer and a uh, hand push tool, a broom. Uh, but he was actually pretty good. And I would sit there and I would watch him. I'd go in and see him about one night every two weeks during the winter and just try to copy what he was, what he was doing. He, he, he didn't communicate. I'd say, Daniel, how are you sharpening that graver? Well, he had a coarse, medium, fine stone in front of him and he'd go. <laughs> I, very no. frustrating. Yes, very no, frustrating. I, how are, you know, uh, he just did it by feel. He didn't know anything about the technical or how to explain it. And he didn't talk much, just super nice guy, but just, just didn't communicate. So I'd go home and try to copy what I thought he was doing. And sometimes it was okay. And sometimes it was even worse than when I started. Um, but, you know, just slowly figured it out. Kind of heard about a show in Reno at the time by some group called Fega. And it was in January. And I thought, well, I can get away for a couple of days. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go to the show. I pictured this great big show, which we now know is not a great big show, right? Not the engraver section. But right. And, and, for, and for, for people who may not know what that is, that's the Firearm Engravers Guild of America show. Correct. Their annual exhibition and wonderful engraving being displayed there. So I went there and, and thought, well, I'll spend all three days and I will make my decision because I didn't have any money to pursue this if it didn't have a chance of at least paying for itself. And I don't know, I was, I was there for 15 minutes looking at stuff and made my decision. And that's because I figured I could do good animals, scenes, people, and I wasn't seeing that on every table. I was seeing what I thought was really nice ornamental scroll work, that type of stuff. Uh, but the animals, I was a pretty good judge of that because I'd done a lot of drawing and pen and ink drawing of animals and people over the years. So that I could judge. And I thought, yeah, maybe let's do it. Okay. So you went, you went back home and did you make your first tools then? Or how did you start after, after you were inspired by this convention? What did you do then? <laughs> yeah. I don't recommend anybody getting started the way I did. All right. I'm going to take this and I'm going to and make move your it first over here. Tools then, or how did you start after, after? All right. You guys see this? Yes. That's, all right. I made this. I went out to the bone pile and I found just a, a chunk of steel and went to the bench grinder and shaped it and put a hole in it, found a broken hammer handle shaped it a little bit, put a screw in the top for the wedge so it would stay there. There's the tool that you would hold in your hand and you would hammer on the end. That's a carriage bolt. That The only thing I bought was this blank and this tiny pin vise that I welded to the end of the carriage bolt. And carry, carriage bolts have, well, threads are not easy on fingers. So I found this industrial hose just in the bone pile at the shop and put it over. And, and this is one of the early plates that I did. Wow. Using the hand. And just uh, trying to learn how to do some gold inlay using copper. That's, yeah, that's one of the early plates before I ever did a gun, so. And this wonderful bag, well, vices are pretty expensive. And this bag is filled with I don't remember whether it's rice or wheat, but what I would do is I would put this, I would embed a plate 
and then I'd tap across and of course it goes then I'd have to stick it back in again and that was my first vice. So for those of you that think you need to have some kind of incredible setup to get started, I would disagree. I would be one that would say, buy the best tools you can, but if you're expecting the latest, greatest device to jump you three levels in engraving, it doesn't happen. You can give a master engraver a broken screwdriver and he's, he's gonna turn out master work. He knows how to sharpen it. He knows what to do with it and, and he's gonna make it work. Um, I currently have two systems on my bench that I use. They're both really good systems that I like. I have a Graver Mach AT that I've used for years and years. And recently I've added this pulse graver, which is what I'm using a little bit more now than the AT. Um, they both have their advantages, disadvantages. And I'm a farmer. I had a toolbox that had all kinds of tools in it. I could certainly make a, a big screwdriver act like a pry bar, but I can tell you that a pry bar worked a lot better as a pry bar than a big screwdriver. And I could make a crescent wrench act like a hammer, but I can tell you that a hammer worked better. So, you know, the nice thing about the pole scraper is I don't need any air. And two years ago, we're, I'm in a high mountain valley in Northern Utah. It gets pretty cold. Last week, I woke up to two inches of snow one night and my air compressor's out in the garage. Well, I was not diligent enough to get all of the water out of it all the time. And it actually froze up on me and I didn't have any air. So it was noisy enough. I didn't want to bring it in my, my little room in the back of the garage. So I actually bought a new silent air, real quiet one. I didn't have to worry about that this winter with the pole sprayer because I'm not using air. So that was one nice thing. It's quiet, um, goes really slow. And I've been accused of liking things that are powerful to go really slow because I drove so many tractors for so many years. Uh, and it does, and I can adjust it. I don't need two hand pieces with the Graver Mach. Um, I use a Magnum and I use a little Monarch, mostly the Magnum. Uh, with the pole scraper, I, I just use one hand piece. I just make the adjustments on it, and, and it's infinitely adjustable. So, you know, that's nice, too. Um, if I need something higher speed, then I can always go to the Graver Mock for other applications, and, and they both work. Potential spam. We're going to turn that off, and we're going to turn the phone off. Okay. Um, so much for potential spam, right? Um, they both have their place on my bench and they both work well. And for me, it kind of completes the toolbox where I have higher end and I have lower end and I can do all kinds of things, but they're, they're both wonderful pieces and they work really well. I would recommend either one of them. So if you're new and you're looking, you just need to try them to see which one feels most natural for you. If you already have one of the two, there's nothing wrong with adding the second one to it to give you just a little more range and versatility. <sighs> Any other questions about tools? Okay. Um, well, I, at some point, we'd like a, a shop tour. Uh, we do have a question here that just came up, though, on, um, on the comments. And the, and I, the question... I always, have, I always have an answer. I just don't know whether they match. Let's try it. Okay. Okay, well, the, the question says... Uh, Lee, you turn out so many highly engraved pieces, it seems like you must work a ton of hours. Just curious, how many hours do you get in in a day and how many days do you get in in a week? Good Remember, question. I farmed for 48 years. It's not hard for me to be at the bench at five or six in the morning. No. I, can, I can attest to that because we have a time difference and I'll call you early, really early, and I can't believe you always pick up the phone. Yeah, um, you know, it depends. Um, I work a lot of hours, but, but you will know if you've done some engraving that 
especially if you work at home, sometimes you have to put in 12, 14 hours to get six, eight hours of bench time because there are distractions and interruptions and things that happen. And especially if you have family at home, uh, you're really convenient and available. And so I, it depends. And if I'm, if I'm going up against a show deadline, like uh, the Vegas show or SCI or one of the big shows, and I'm trying to get something ready for a client that they can have on their table, um, man, it's harvest time for the farmer. And it, it can be 16, 18 hours if needed. It's not good on the body. But you yeah, do what you I, have to I have I have engraved screws and finished up a job in the hotel room the night before the show opens with a leatherman as my hammer and a little tapping on the end of a little graver underneath the lamp in a hotel room using a pillow for the, for the vice. Uh, yeah, I have done that. Okay, Again, cool. I, having been there, it's on the do not recommend list. <laughs> okay, we have another question here. Uh, someone wants to know what sharpening system do you use? Um, one that I got years and years ago from GRS. Uh, like it, the dual it, angle fixture? Yeah. yeah actually, I, I have two, two of them that, that, that they were selling at the time. And, you know, they both work fine. So um, I've not tried the other sharpening systems, but I would suspect that they all work equally fine. I, I don't know that there's any advantage to one over the other. They now have reversible reversible units so that you can you can turn that um, that diamond wheel in two directions yeah, that might be an advantage for some things I don't have that mine's way too old but uh, you know that technology has been around for a long time and I think all of the systems probably work fine I don't have any experience with the Lindsay templates they look interesting to me and that might be something that I would find useful just if he had a geometry that I liked, that uh, it would be quick and easy. So that, that would be the one thing that I might add that I don't have. Yeah, I found, uh, I like you have the old style single direction turning power hone and the old dual angle fixture. That's kind mm -hmm. of my go-to. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but recently for shows and things, um, I have picked up a couple of the Lindsay templates because for a show, um, sitting there, it's, it's very easy and quick, and I don't have to bring a lot of equipment. Um, right. Obviously, I'm limited then to only whatever those gravers are at the show. Usually, they're for people to come and test, but, but it does work really slick for the geometries he makes them for. So, so there's that, and I think GRS has something they call mm -hmm. it easy graver or easy sharpener or something like that that is a plug in, swipe it across, and you know, those types of things um, I think would be useful. I'm just too cheap to buy them right now. <laughs> I, I okay. you know, gave them to me. I'm sure I'd use them a lot and love them, but <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Um, so what, what, hon? Well, we can either show pictures or we can keep doing questions. Okay, yeah. Well, we have, we have another question, and then maybe we can get to... Um, your shop tour, and then you have a bunch of pictures too, which I'm sure is oh. going to have even more questions. Okay, um, but since you're sitting there and you kind of had the Optivisor or other visor on now, we have a question um, that actually is some, from someone in Alaska who is asking, what are your thoughts on posture while using a visor? Timely question. I just came from an appointment with a back specialist. <laughs> and I have back issues. Um, you know, I watched Joachim's interview and he was talking about that and he's had a couple of operations he mentioned. Um, I don't know, you know, keep the back as straight as you can. Oh, here's what, here's what we tend to do as people. 
So we get working on part of the gun down on the barrel or something, and we find ourselves like this for an hour or two. And then when we finally straighten up, we first thing that comes to our mind is that was a really, really bad idea because it hurts. Um, I suppose what I'm going to try to do is think more in terms of adjusting everything to me instead of me to it. So I'm, I'm going to try and get a posture. This is one of the nice things about a microscope is to set it up properly. What you do is you sit in a chair that's really comfortable where the angle of your legs going out and your knees and everything is the most comfortable it can be. And then you move everything to fit you. You move the microscope down to fit you. You move your workpiece up to fit so that everything is in adjustment to you instead of the other way around. I've seen people try to set up a microscope situation. And so they'll put the scope and then they try to fit themselves into the scope. No, no, you're the boss. Everything adjusts to you and your best, most comfortable posture. But we don't seem to do that as well when we're dealing with uh, an optimizer. Uh, it's, it's just too easy to autofocus by moving your head and your body. So I'm gonna try and think more in terms of how I would do it with a microscope and put my body in the best position I can and then try to adjust my work accordingly. And, and if you don't have a way to move vices up and down or swing them around easily, that becomes a little annoying because it's just so much easier to make the adjustment with your body, but that that's where you're going to get back problems, I think. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but, and I've got to get up more. I can get focused on my work and I can get locked in for hours. And then when I finally get up, that's again, when I'm thinking uh, that was a really, really bad idea. I probably need to discipline myself to set a timer so that I get up every 45, 50 minutes, every they, hour. They, pro they probably have an app for that. Yeah, I bet I'm you there is one. I'm sure, but I'm not much of a techie, but yeah, no, you're right. I just need to do it. I need to get up and move more. And okay. part of my problem is I don't use a microscope a lot. I use a really cheap, $15 Army Surplus Optivisor clone. But so if I used a microscope for him, maybe that, that would help some. And I'm getting older. I'm moving more that direction. Both my back and eyes are suggesting that that might be a good move. OK. And uh, what we have, oh, one more, which was your preferred graver for cutting gun work. Let's go ahead and put this one up and he can talk about that. I'm sorry, what? Let's go ahead and put up a picture and then he can talk about what he used. Oh, okay, yeah, we can put up a picture and you can, you know, generally talk about gravers and what you, knowing you, I bet you there's a, you have a favorite and that's pretty much what you do everything with. That, that was one of the questions though. Yeah, people may hate me for saying this, but I do almost all of my cutting with the same graver. I cut the outlines of my scroll. I do the shading. I do the bolino. I use a 110. Okay, this is the farmer in me, probably. I just simplified my life and I use the 110 for everything. Everything on that picture that you're seeing was done with a 110. Uh, typically a 50 degree face and a 20 degree heel. Now there will be people that will say, well, that 20 degree lift on the hill is too high for Bellino work. And I'm not disagreeing. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty high angle and it might be more comfortable to hand push at 10 or 12 degrees or even 15 because your angle of attack is lower. It's a little more comfortable on your wrist, but I have learned to do it and um, I only need to figure out one graver. Now, if I'm going on a, if I'm going on a convex surface, I do have some with a little less lift on the heel. Um, because if you're going around a, a convex surface and you've got a 20 degree lift, sometimes that really feels awkward and a lower, lower angle of attack, like a, like a 15 degree 
just a little more comfortable. So there are places for it. I, I just like to simplify my life. And, and which kind of heels do you put on that graver? Are they more of the traditional heel or more of the parallel up the side heel? Um, it's more parallel up the side. And this is how I do it. I will put the <clears throat> I will put the relief on the bottom at 120 degrees. I'll take a square graver and I'll just grind my 120 in all the way along. And then I will put my heels on at 110 degrees, which is not a perfect parallel heel. If the lift is 20 degrees on the heel and you're putting you're putting your your angle on at 110 degrees, it's not a perfectly parallel heel but it doesn't have to be. It brings that grind up the side. So I guess what I'm saying is, your grind going up the side doesn't have to be perfectly parallel. It just has to go up the side. So I will have a triangular shape, but it's a really, really long one that will go up. And then it works the same. If you roll the graver over, you've just got to make sure that however far you roll it over, you're not going to roll it so far that you go above where the grind is or else you're going to get a facet in that right cut or that flare cut that you're trying to make. Uh, does it have to be perfectly parallel? No, it just has to extend up the side farther than however far you're going to roll it over. Does that make sense? Now, the one thing that I wouldn't do is, this is fine, parallel is fine. Don't go like this where it's wider at the top than at the bottom or you're actually kind of trying to force it through with a little bit of a wedge and that doesn't work very well. Okay, so with, with this parallel geometry that you mentioned, you basically have a negative right behind the point then, right? You're slightly negative for clearance, right, uh, right behind the heels. Yeah, that might be. I've not really thought about that much. I just know that it works well. Okay. I, th I think it is. Well, <laughs> okay, I, I know. I will neither agree nor disagree. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's how I do most of my gravers too. And I like that. Yeah. And I found it out from you in all full disclosure, a lot of things I found out from you, but right. um, I, I guess my point is I, I don't, if you've got a template that will put a perfectly parallel heel on great. But if you're trying to figure it out yourself, it's not worth the time to try and make it perfectly parallel. It just has to extend up far enough. And, you know, there might be people that would disagree with me technically, but, but it gets the job done. Okay, very cool. Want to show more? What yeah, let's see, let's go back to the picture. So the, the first one was, um, you had multicolor gold in the background, like in the sunset. Um, and then this one is, well, why don't you describe what is this gun? Uh, it's a C96, uh, nicknamed a Mauser broom handle. Um, not a very attractive gun. It's just basically a box. But uh, what I did to try and break up the lines is that lion, kind of pseudo whatever lion on the front. There you go. That was carved out of wax, and then we cast it in silver because silver casts real well. And then gold plated it, and then I attached it to the front of the magazine box. And I did that to break up just those really harsh 90 degree lines that were there and, and the box to give it a little more flow. And then you stick the tongue out there and you know put it in a little bit of a scroll type design. And uh, that just really helps the flow and the design of the whole thing. And if you go down to the bottom of the box, you see the gold line that's coming through. It goes over the top of the trigger and then it comes around to the front and curves around. Yeah, now go, go to the front of the gun with your cursor. See how that line curves around? And it'll lead the eye, that gold line will lead the, the eye up into the scene, but also can just kind of let it flow over onto the lion. Is it just, just made it more elegant, I thought. Now, this is an interesting piece. 
I wanted to go back, uh, do a period piece, World War I. And I love that period of time because that was kind of the transition between motorized vehicles and the equine, or if you're in Africa, the camels were the cavalry. I tried to get the client to let me put a, a great big camel on the side of it, but he opted for a horse, imagine that. Um, so the fellow, the machine gunner, that is an overlay. That was all cut out of a separate piece and sculpted and then attached to the magazine box. So if you had a side view, you would see that proud about probably at least an eighth of an inch. And then the guy right behind him is, I think he's sculpted and then the rest of it is flat back there. So I, I got different levels, which was kind of fun to do. And pretty interesting to cut out a piece and sculpt it and attach it and have everything work right. But uh, turned out nice. At least the client was happy. It was a beautiful gun. I, I got to see that at the Fega show, as did many other people, and it was beautiful. There's a little bit of a story behind this one. This is actually a mezuzah. Those familiar with the Jewish religion will understand its importance and how it is used. Um, my oldest figure? son, my oldest son ended up with stage four brain cancer. And he was in the hospital for 21 days. And my wife and I, you know, we, one of us was there all the time. And often both of us were there with him 24 seven. And uh, just as my therapy kind of, I decided to do this and I have pictures of me sitting in the light of the hotel room or the light of the window coming in through the hospital room with me sitting in a chair with my optimizer and a hand push tool just doing this. And uh, when it was done, so it, it was done with kind of crude tools and crude magnification and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but when it was done, I sent it to a very dear friend of mine, Marty Rubino, who at the time was also dealing with cancer. And, and he is Jewish. So I sent it to him. And I said, Marty, I don't know any Jewish prayers. So I, I put a Mormon prayer in the back of it. You'll either have to accept it or throw it away and put your own prayer in it. Whatever you want to do is fine. And when I got to visit him a few years later, he took me into a shop and he said, I want you to see where I put this. It has a place of honor in it. And he had it, he had it there where, where he could look at it. And so that was nice. Anyway, that was kind of my therapy for uh, being in the hospital with my son, who's doing well now. Oh, I love this piece. I love this piece. So... <clears throat> I do work for people sometimes that have really big collections. And I feel like I'm doing this piece and it's just being thrown in the vault with the other 50, 100, 200 that they already have, right? And uh, they value it, but sometimes you wonder how much. Well, this particular guy, he called me and it's the only thing he's ever had engraved and he saved for years, I don't know how long, but, but he saved up money to be able to afford this one project. And I said, what do you want on it? He said, this is gonna be a tribute to my father who recently passed away. Um, tell me about your father. He said, well, he was in World War II. So it was my dad. Where was he? What did he do? Tell me about World War II and his experience. He said, well, there were two things that were kind of unique. He said, first of all, he was on the very first inflatable boat that crossed the Rhine River. Now, now think about that. First one to go into Germany when we finally invaded, right? And he was in the Battle of the Bulge in the snows in Belgium. I thought, those, those are two great scenes. I can kind of picture them. What else? He said, well, his favorite activity was coon hunting. And he used this gun to do it. It was a little twenty-two. Uh, I said, okay, there's three 
do you have a fourth? Do you have a portrait of him somewhere? He said, well, I've got an old black and white photograph. I said, great, we'll go with that. I said, I can divide these sides in half. I can create four panels. I can tell four stories. So there you have the moonlight with the backlighting. And can we get a bigger shot? I'm just having, this, can, can, you can you blow it up even more? So while he's describing the panels, we can see them a little bit better. That's all. Yeah, you know, there we go. thank you. One of the things I really liked was just the black white contrast between the two scenes and how dramatic it could be. Um, you know, the moon coming through the clouds at night, providing some of the backlighting and you don't have much detail and I don't think you should. You have the, the light reflecting off the water on the bottom of the boat and I think it tells the whole story. These guys are just kind of coming through as quietly and secretly as they can. Now, historically, I don't know whether it was a night invasion or not, but it was what I wanted to do. And I, you know, it just created the effect I wanted. And then you have the snows. There you go. Um, you can almost feel the snow falling as the figures that are farther away, you can barely see in the trees, you can barely see, you get that aerial perspective in there, that depth that, that is needed. And um, I really like the way this site turned out. And so did he. Okay, next slide's going to show the other side, I think. There you have a picture of the father off of an old black and white photograph, which was really faded and I kind of had to make up some stuff. And, but he reported to me that there were some people that had known his father that were still alive and when they saw it, they said it was a spitting image of him. They recognized instantly and that's always a great compliment. And then you have the night scene with the, you know, the flashlight and you can just imagine the coon up in the tree and there's the dog howling away, baying, whatever the proper term is. Uh, this meant so much to him. It's a family heirloom. So this is not just one that's going in a collection of 200. I mean, this guy, these projects are very personal to him and can be very satisfying to the engraver and just bring a lot of joy. There's, there's just a lot more meaning to these heirloom type projects like this. I hope that makes sense to people. Very cool, it's, uh, and it's great that you sent the pictures ahead so that everyone can see the detail that you're talking about in these. Uh, this is a knife. Um, I don't know, just wanted a bird of prey on there and something a little more dramatic in the background. And you can see that bad boy swooping down on, what is it, a rabbit? I can't remember what I put in there. Probably a rabbit. Yeah, there we go. Peter Rabbit better run fast or find some cover. He's in trouble. That, that was a fun piece to do. I like that one. Okay. What do we have up next? Ah. Uh, Lousy photograph, but you get the feel. So I sent this picture not to the client, but to another client that I had. And he said, oh my goodness, that Sandhill crane, that, what is that? About three eighths of an inch above the metal? I said, no, it's dead flat. No, 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 it's not. How high above? I said, it's dead flat. It's just all an illusion. It's all shading. So this is this is one of those three D shadings that are so fun and so interesting and such a intellectual challenge because you invent the light source and you have to picture and imagine how it's going to hit the animals and where the shadows are going to be. Boy, that really is a lousy picture, but it created that three D illusion, which is really really fun and interesting to do. You can't do that unless you really understand light and shade because you're inventing everything. And at least for me, that's an awful lot of the fun. Even that scroll work, it's, it's all dead flat. 
but it has the appearance that it's up above because of the way the shadows have been cast. Yeah, it looks like you have so many layers there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fun and challenging part, I suppose. And did, you did all of the, uh, the wood carving work on this one as well, too, right? I did. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. In fact, for me, that's at least as much fun as the engraving, maybe more. I just don't get to do it very often. Um, it's more of a European thing, it seems. Americans just want their, want their stocks checkered. And I only have a couple of clients that let me do wood carving. But a lot of fun when I get to. And did, is the, do you have to put more thought into the woodwork part? Or does it come just as easily to you as scroll work on the metal part? No, I treat it the same as I would sculpting on steel. And a lot of the techniques are the same as well. So I just design it and cut it the same way. Um, when you're doing a scroll and you're going around 360, I don't care which direction the grain's going. You're always going to be going across it or with it or against it at some point. So just have really, really sharp tools and cut very carefully and don't try to take too much at once. If, you're, uh, if you need to make a deeper cut, do it in two or three or four passes. Just shave it down instead of trying to take it all. That's when you're going to get in trouble and chip something out. Yeah, I'm gonna skip two pictures real quick because it was a painting picture. Okay, and does, does, does that also apply to how you deal with deep cutting in metal? Do you do multiple passes or do you try to get everything done in one pass if you can? No, usually multiple passes, you get in trouble. You can get in trouble trying to get it all at once. Uh, really experienced guys can do it uh, and I will do it sometimes, but it's much safer to go a little at a time, uh, at least two passes, maybe, maybe not four or five. I'm not talking about shaving it down. Um, you know, a thousandth at a time. Uh, but it's a little easier on your gravers. And as you work your way down with successive passes, you can make whatever needed corrections are necessary. Uh, that was redundant, needed, necessary. But it's just safer. It's a safer way to do it, okay? If you're off a little bit, you can make some minor corrections. If you try to take it all at once and you're not really experienced, You know, you might cut in a little too close or be a little too wide, or if you're too wide, you can always shave it off. But, but you know, it may not, it's really hard to correct if you take it all at once. Okay. That's, that's the butt plate of the gun that I had at the recent Vega exhibition in Vegas. Um, that's all sculpted and it's fairly deep. It's deeper than it would appear in the picture. So the background's relieved and then beaded and those are what they call cold enameling for the birds. And then the flowers are platinum and gold. And that's, uh, is this the first time you did this type of cold enameling, or is this something you've been doing more of? Second gun. That's a side view. Um, okay, maybe we can get a little closer up just to get some of the detail in there. Yeah, there you can see that it is sculpted and sculpted. I mean, there's deeper sculpting for sure, but it's not what I would call real light superficial sculpt. It's, it has some depth to it. Oh, I like how it looks like your your metal, that one part in the metal, the scroll kind of continues into the wood. So it's taking your eye that way. That's very yeah. cool. So this gun is a mini Hagen. Uh, caliber is a 218B. It's a very small caliber. It was a small frame. We didn't have a lot of real estate. So what the client wanted to do was expand the real estate as much as possible or the canvas. Um, so we, we carved the stock 
And as you noted, the steel and the, and the wood, they flow together. It's all one continuous pattern and carried the engraving up and onto the tube of the scope. Boy, when we were done with the butt plate and everything, there was a lot of, a lot of engraving that went on this gun. Very time consuming. And how, how many weeks does something like that take for you to do? I have about 700 hours in this one with the stock carving, the, uh, the gold inlay on the stock. Uh, and part of it was just the massive amount of sculpting. Sculpting takes a lot more time than flat engraving. Huh. This was fun. This was a fun piece. Rob's trying to get it um, dialed in here so we can see it closer. Got the old saloon scene going. So the guy standing up that's uh, disrupting the table, that's an overlay just like that uh, room handle Mauser was. That, that cowboy with the gun in his hand, he was, he was cut out of steel and sculpted and then attached. So he's, he's about an eighth of an inch proud probably. You've got the poker chips and things flying all over the place. And you've got the lady trying to drum up some business. And, and the old guy on the right couldn't care less what's going on. Just fun. So I had this at Dallas Safari Club. And a couple of guys came up. And I told them the whole story. It, go to the next one. I think I have the train scene on the other side. And then, yeah. So here's the story. So the horse rider, he's proud as well about an eighth of an inch. <clears throat> so the story that I was telling him was, you've got these guys that decided they were gonna go rob a train and they were successful, but they're not entirely bright. And then I flip it over and I go back to the saloon. And I say, they just had to spend it. They couldn't stay quiet. They had to spend it. They got liquored up. One of them got upset thought the other guy was cheating and, you know, it turns into this big fiasco, right? They looked at each other and they looked at me and they started to laugh and they said, you have no idea how close to the truth this is. And I said, no, I don't. And I don't think I want to know. And we all laughed and then they left. Yeah, so the, the smoke is sculpted. There's a lot of sculpting on this as well. The train, everything was sculpted in, except for the scroll work. Scroll work was flat work, but the scene is all sculpted. Fun piece. Really enjoyed dreaming that one up. Rob is uh, working on getting some of the other pictures up here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, he's going to work on getting more pictures up. Want the shop That's tour in the meantime? Yeah, yeah, we can do on the shop tour while he tries to work on the other pictures. Okay, here we go. Here is kind of my crude and primitive setup. Toolboxes work really great, actually, for storing a lot of items. Uh, that's my vise. It's on a just a drill press stand. Um, they're my machines. Microscope. Um, this is the area when I teach. I have places here for three students. Um, I, I have a couple of machines. If people wanted to come and bring their own machine, they would be welcome. I could not care less what brand it is. I really couldn't care less. Two awards is just a stupid thing in my mind. <laughs> uh, the business section, there we go. File File cabinets. 
bookshelf with books. Uh, temporary relief for the back. My daughter was in Korea working for a year and she sent that back to me. She said, oh, dad, this reminded me of you. Uh, that's my youngest daughter right there. That, that was a two hour painting I did of her. She was just sitting for me. That was fun. Just some more drawings and paintings I've done. My third great grandmother, I did that, I don't know, 40 years ago. Eagle the same. Guns. Uh, light. Certificate. There's a good workbench right there where I can assemble, disassemble, do some things. And, uh, you know, the nice view out the window of my neighbor's garage so I can spy on their garage and make sure that nothing suspicious is going on there. You, you have to show the, um, the two walls of awards because you're a very decorated engraver. Well. I know you won't say it, but I'm saying it. One or two, I suppose. <laughs> oh, I have three walls oh. now. Yeah, well, I guess there's, yeah, there's something up there. That's pretty much, that's pretty much the tour. And now you, you do take private students. Are you, are you able to take students if they call you and want to learn uh, either privately or in little groups? Yep, either way. Um, over the years, I've had people come in for anywhere from a day to two weeks, whatever they want. I don't care, I don't have a set curriculum. My curriculum is determined by whatever they need, whatever they want. And I'll take anything from basic to whatever the most advanced technique they can dream of is. Um, maybe the place I've helped people the most is in the drawing, design, layout type stuff. And with that type of thing, summers are really, really nice here. I mean, you've been here in the summer. This is a high mountain valley. It's beautiful. Weather's great. And we can open up the, the garage and put tables out. I mean, if, if there was a group of eight or 10 people that wanted to come in and just do a drawing class, a design layout class, or, uh, you know, drawings for Bellino prep or something like that, that would be really easy to do. I'd love to do that or smaller groups. So that's available. If people want to come in and learn more engraving techniques, then we're limited to the number of machines I have, or they bring their own in either way. And that would be limited probably to three, maybe four at the most. Or, and what, or, and what um, I, because I, I know we talked a little bit yesterday, you said drawing and then some more advanced techniques you think you would be really helpful with that people can't necessarily get other instructors for. Or as many times? Um, you know, wood carving, certainly, if somebody was interested in the wood carving, I don't know that there's a lot of instruction out there, at least not the way I do it. What I've seen out there for wood carving tends to be just a Dremel or a rotary type tool where they're doing fish scale basket weave, you know, transferring some type of animal on there. And, um, I, I do things a little different. So that would be a possibility. Uh, advanced gold techniques where we're mixing different colors and getting sunsets and stuff like that. Or instead of a tree that looks like a lollipop, we diffuse the edges and make it kind of lacy and, and more natural and lifelike. That would be a possibility. Um, oh. I just thought of something. And I, Maybe they can see this negative. You got to put it up. There you go. All right. Now you got to. Can you see how fine that grass is? Yes. That's thinner than a hair on my head. So we could talk about how do you do that? And how do you create that 
So picture that grass and how lacy it is. And picture that as the edge of a tree instead of your lollipop tree. And make the tree a lot more lifelike. So there could be things like that. I mean, whatever people want. Okay, I have well, well, good to know that you're taking on students based on your schedule and stuff. That's very cool. Yeah, just contact me and we'll just work it out. Um, one of the I, questions. I, I wouldn't recommend the dead of winter. Travel can be a little dicey. But boy, late spring, summer, early fall, this place really has nice weather. Okay, more questions? Uh, yeah, we have another question um, based on your, your, I guess it, well, it says on just sculpting. Uh, the question is, do you also have a rotary tool for your sculpting? It doesn't say whether that's metal or wood sculpting. Well, I do, but I rare, rarely use it. I'm using, I'm using punches and gravers to do my sculpting on metal. And in wood, the one place where I do use the rotary is background removal. Because you, you can take a bird and you can go straight down and around edges. Whereas if you're trying to get in there with some type of a, a wood carving tool, you know, it's really hard to do that without gouging up edges, but boy, to go straight down and to get rid of wood, uh, that's the way to do it is with a rotary tool. Other than that, I, I rarely use a rotary tool for any of the sculpting or modeling. Okay. And um, another question was, how are you attaching the steel overlays? Today, I'm using a laser welder. A few years ago, it was other stuff and I don't recommend it. I, I mean, there, there are ways to do it, but, um, or, um, well, you can do overlays and, and attach it the traditional way, but I have access to a laser welder through a local jeweler and boy, that that is slick once you learn how to use it. and. Um, how to do it without leaving a lot of weld marks on the edges and stuff. That, that takes a little bit of know-how and ingenuity to try and figure out how to hide all that stuff, but, but it's a great way to attach things. So most of my attachment now would be done that way. Okay. And do we have um, well, we got a couple more pictures to, couple more pictures to do? Okay. Yep, fun piece, wanted to do Civil War, wanted to pay tribute to both the North and South because in my opinion, there were very honorable people on both sides. And uh, so for the North, we have the Capitol building, which is not completely historically correct, but I used my artistic license. Um, and then for the South, you know, that's loosely based on Robert E. Lee's home. You'll see a lot of similarities. Uh, lower right-hand corner, you see the butterfly? Yep, there's the butterfly. That was kind of fun. Um, as far as the ornamental, uh, just those dolphin heads were kind of a fun theme to put in over on the left. Go up, 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 right there. You have them on top of each other. And then you really need to have the eagle and the flags on the side. A lot of symbolism there. So that, that was really a fun piece to design. I, I love the ornamental work in this one and, and figuring, figuring it out, it was, it was fun. No, not quite yet. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I'd always okay. figured I could. I'd always figured 
figured I couldn't paint because I was colorblind and then kind of an unusual, it's a long story that I won't bore you with, but uh, I actually was commissioned to do this piece and I didn't know anything about painting. So I had to go on YouTube to learn how to prep a canvas and mix colors and do a bunch of stuff. And the colors are not very vivid, vivid on that. It didn't come through very well. But that's the first painting I ever did. It's excellent. I, I remember when you were doing it and I, I was, just, I don't know why I was astonished you could paint as well as you could, you could, <laughs> but it's, it's really cool. I would recommend everybody draw, draw, draw. I don't care what art discipline you're talking about, whether it's painting, sculpture, engraving, drawing is the basis for all of them. Just you cannot draw enough or get good enough at drawing. Okay, I think I think uh, Rob's pulling up one more picture. Ah, uh, yes. First portraits I ever did. Uh, so I came up with this idea that we should pay tribute to Frank Brownell, who has done so much for the Engravers Guild over the years and for engravers in general. Just an absolute wonderful, wonderful man and very dear friend. And I figured that he had more certificates and kind of, I don't know, honorary awards stacked up and he didn't need another one. Let's do something really, really unique. So I contacted Barry, Barry Lee Hans, the president of the guild. I said, I've got this idea. I want to paint portraits of the three generations of the Brownell Company. Let's present it at the banquet at Fega. And if it doesn't turn out well, you and I are the only ones that will ever know that I ever attempted it. If it does turn out well, then we'll actually go through with this. And uh, that is probably about uh, 24, 30 inches tall. So, you know, it's just look at the width on it. So it, they're fairly good size. It's not real small. And uh, we did, we, we had it on an easel at the banquet. We had a sheet over it. And everybody was wondering what in the world it would be. And they called Frank up on stage and then they unveiled it. And I think it really touched him. It is now hanging in their headquarters in a, he tells me an honored place. Those are all the pictures. Okay, yep, the, those are all the pictures that we have from okay. your, um, that you sent. Is there anything else you'd like to tell people about or let them know? Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, do we have any other questions? I mean, how would people want to get in touch with him? Oh, you know, yeah, well, yes, that's true. How, how would people get in touch with you? Um, you can give out whatever, you know, websites or Instagram or whatever, um, if they wanted to either have you work on one of their objects or if they wanted classes with you. LeeGriffithsEngraving.com, that's the website. I don't know what I am on Facebook and Instagram. I'm not very active. I know I'm there. It's probably Lee Griffiths Engraving or Lee R. Griffiths, something like that. You, you guys are a lot smarter than I am. You'll find me. Okay, and, and, and you are also, you're also t uh, giving classes a couple of places. Now, of course, the schedules may change <laughs> because of the virus now, but where were you scheduled I, to teach? Yeah, I was scheduled with Gabriel Owens Jewelry Institute of America for a couple of classes. Uh, when things quiet down, we'll probably reschedule. I had one scheduled with Wes Griffin, Texas School of Engraving, um, canceled or postponed that one. And I suspect that will go through at some point. So I'm available if you have a small school or you want to bring me in as a guest instructor, you know, contact me and we'll visit and 
make sure it works for both of us. And whatever, I, I, I enjoy teaching. I like people and I like to help them and watch them progress. I guess the two things that I would say, just trying to pretend I'm wise, which most people would argue against, but um, enjoy the journey, okay? There's no destination. I get up every morning trying to figure out a new trick, a new technique, a new twist, something that I can do that I haven't done before. That's what's really fun for me is to, is just, the continual progress. And the other thing is, um, you know, I would have students ask me how much money they can make engraving or would talk about business. And one of the questions I would ask them would be, what is the difference between a $500 engraving and a $5,000 engraving? And I'd get lots of different answers. And I'd, I would say, it's really simple. There's only one difference. The $5,000 job gets more lines but the quality of the line needs to be identical regardless of the budget. You always engrave to a standard, the highest standard you can, whether it's a small budget or a big budget, the quality of lines needs to be the same. They just get a whole lot more lines for 5,000. Food for thought. Yeah, well. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, I enjoy all of my engraver friends. And if you've tuned in, you know, thank you. You flatter me that you would spend some of your time just listening to an old farm boy. Okay. And I don't think we have any more questions. So I think so. I think what you all you can do now is I mean just remind people to subscribe and stuff. Okay. So so you just gave away your um, your email, which is, I guess, the preferred way to get in touch with you. Um, if someone wants to get a hold of me, it's uh, tira at engraver.com. On Instagram, it's tira.mitchell or pulsegraver. And uh, engraver.com on Facebook. We have a, a Facebook page as well. And please subscribe on YouTube. Oh, and please subscribe. Yes, please subscribe because um, that way you'll get notifications when we have the next interview or interviews. And it also helps us get information out about and ask questions about what you would like to see. Uh, so if there are any other topics or people you'd like to see, put them in the comments. And it was I real think, nice talking. I think this is where we say that's a wrap folks. No, it was.